Hello and welcome. This is Matthew, and today we have something a little bit different. Instead of just looking at a screen recording of a terminal using emulated hardware, we have a real VaxStation 4060. I got this off of eBay in, I want to say about the year 2001. Uh, it was obviously surplused from uh, a government sale or something that, that wasn't using them anymore. There's actually a Department of Agriculture from Canada uh, label on the back of it. So this was at one point uh, in government service up north in Canada. I don't have a compatible monitor, keyboard, or mouse for it, uh, so I can't use it as a graphical workstation. However, I do have this WISE 520 terminal so we can just plug that into the serial console port of the VAX and use VMS the way it was really meant to be used uh, through the command line. There is a tape drive in here. I believe it's a TK50 tape drive, if that sounds right. Unfortunately, uh, something's broken and uh, there's a tape in there that no matter what I do, it just won't. Uh, it won't unload and eject the tape. So I've, uh, I've removed power from that because otherwise it just flashes all of those lights due to its error state constantly, which gets kind of annoying. Uh, so that's in the system, but unpowered. So let's go ahead and turn this on. We'll start with the terminal here. Yep. There's that blinking cursor we love. Uh, not a true green screen. As you can see, this one has white text. And we can power on the Vax. So relatively quiet with just the power supply fans running. If we give it a minute here, there we go, it'll start its self-tests. Um, now it takes a while to test this 40 megabytes of memory. Memory access speeds uh, aren't what they are now. But importantly, you'll also note that we get the MAC address of the Ethernet interface. And that will be important because we are going to netboot this from a server from a VAX cluster that is running under SimH, the emulator, on my Linux desktop machine. So that's one of the neat features of uh, VAX hardware and VAX clusters, is that rather than having to have the system software installed in a local drive in this VAX station, I am able to make it a satellite node of my VAX cluster and it will boot over the network, uh, over DECnet, in fact, and use the system disk in whatever uh, cluster member it's booting off of. Now, because this does have a hard drive in it, uh, which hasn't spun up yet, uh, I can use the local hard drive for the page and um, uh, swap file. Uh, and that'll be faster than using page and swap over the network. Uh, so certainly whenever uh, a local drive is available, you will want to use that for your page and swap files. Uh, but otherwise, everything will be running off of the network volume that it boots off of from the simulated VAX. And indeed, if I didn't have a hard drive at all in here, you could use a network device uh, to store your page and swap file. So this really could be a diskless terminal running whatever software I have installed in my cluster. So we'll wait for this to finish booting, uh, but the first thing we need to do is, oh, that nice little tone there. Uh, the first thing we need to do is build our VAX cluster that we're going to boot this from. So let's go do that now, and uh, I'll see you over at the terminal on my Linux system. Welcome back to the familiar terminal console environment that you're so used to seeing in my videos. So as I said, this is my desktop Linux system here at home. It's on the same network as my VAX station. Uh, so my Linux 
machine network card here is plugged into the same ethernet switch that I've plugged the ethernet interface on my VAX station into. And we will be able to set up uh, SimH, the VAX emulator, to bridge its virtual network interface to my Linux machine's real network interface so that any network traffic inside of my simulated VAX here on my Linux box will be able to communicate out over the network to my real VAX station hardware. So this video isn't going to be a tutorial really on the different networking options for, uh, for things like Hercules and SimH. Uh, that may be an interesting video topic unto itself because there are a few different ways you can do it depending on what you want to accomplish. But in this case, we need to bridge the SimH virtual ethernet interface with my Linux box's real physical ethernet interface. Um, that's the only way that packet traffic from my SimH VAX instance will be able to go out to the network wire coming out the back of my Linux box through the network switch and over to my VAX station. Uh, so the way we do that, again, this isn't going to be a full tutorial, but just briefly. Uh, first, I have my Linux box set up. If I do bridge control show, uh, I have a bridge interface, BR0, and my physical interface, EN01, is attached to that bridge. So any other interfaces that I add to this bridge it will be as if they're all plugged into the same ethernet switch. Uh, and that's essentially what a bridge is. In network terminology, uh, a bridge is very much like an ethernet switch uh, in that it allows broadcast packets to pass through, uh, and then it does some MAC address table caching to know if it needs to pass traffic uh, through its various ports to allow node-to-node -node communication. But in any case, Linux has an Ethernet bridge built in. Uh, and so if you rearrange the way your network card is set up in Linux, uh, you're able to put your network card into the bridge, and then the Linux kernel itself attaches to the network through the bridge interface rather than directly through the, uh, the Ethernet card or the network interface. So we need another interface in here that our simulated VAX will attach to. And current versions of SimH are able to use uh, TUN TAP networking. And so we can create a TAP interface, which is a virtual network interface that programs, such as the SimH emulated VAX, are able to attach themselves to. And then they just write packets and receive packets from them as if they're real hardware interfaces. Uh, so we have the IP TUN TAP command. And if we do help here, uh, again, on modern Linux systems here, we can say um, IP, and then we have a number of commands and modes to manage the different aspects of networking. And one of those is TunTap to create these TunTap devices. So we'll do sudo IP TunTap. We want to add a new interface. We want the mode to be a TAP interface. I'm going to say user M. Wilson. Um, this is part, I think, of the magic that makes it so I can run SimH not as root. I'll just be able to run it as my regular user, but I'll have permission to attach to this tap interface I'm creating. And we want to give it a name. So the device name we're creating, I'm going to call it tap vax. Uh, and that way it's clear that this is the tap interface we've created for our simulated vax system. And that should be all I need on that. Uh, the other thing we need to do is now that I have this tap interface, we want to add it to my bridge. So that's sudo bridge control. And then I believe I say add if, I think, for add interface. And I want to add an interface to bridge zero. And the interface I want to add is tap vax. Okay, let's do BR control show to see if that worked. It did. So now my Ethernet bridge has my physical real Ethernet card in my machine here, as well as this, uh, this virtual Ethernet card that we're going to use as the VAX's network interface. 
So now packet traffic can freely travel from this tap fax interface out to the real ethernet cable going to the real switch uh, out of the ethernet port on the back of my Linux desktop system here. Uh, the last thing we're going to need to do is to show, um, or rather to tell the kernel that we want to activate this interface, uh, essentially, you know, turn it on so that uh, it's available for traffic to flow through. And we do that with the IP link, then we'll set the tap vax interface up. Sorry, not dev. IP link set dev tap vax up. Uh, and this just changes the link state in Linux to up, so this interface is available for use. So far, so good. So in my emulated vax uh, directory here, I have a few files already. I have the CD image that you get when you uh, apply for the OpenVMS hobbyist program. So this is the CD that has, among other things, the OpenVMS 7.3 operating system. I have this CD image I've made that uh, it's just something I've built over time of some useful things I like to have available as soon as I install new VAX systems or VMS systems. One of them is my license key file uh, from the hobbyist program. So I find the easiest way on a new system to just quickly install all of the licenses is to have that file available on a CD that I can mount uh, once VMS is installed. I also have the SimH VAX simulator itself. Uh, traditionally, SimH has simulated a MicroVax 3900 system. Uh, but recent versions, and the, the current version of the source code for SimH on GitHub, a number of other specific models have been added that SimH can emulate. Uh, so just to be a little bit different than maybe what you've seen in most of the instructions online for simulating different VAX systems, I've gone ahead and built the VAX 8600 version of SimH. And then I have the configuration file for it. We'll look at that. Uh, I don't have the hard drive file yet. That will be created uh, as soon as we start this up for the first time. And then we'll go through just a quick, pretty minimal install of OpenVMS 7.3. Uh, so you can see from scratch how I'm building this VAX 8600 uh, to be my first cluster member and then to be a boot server for satellite nodes. So let's look at that config file. And once again, this isn't really going to be a tutorial on installing VMS or using SimH. Um, there's a lot to do to get kind of a nice usable VMS system beyond just the initial install from CD. If a series on VMS uh, and VAXs would be interesting to you, let me know in the comments below. That might be a good topic uh, that we could make a few videos on. Uh, but just briefly, so you know uh, what's going on for this experiment that we're doing today, uh, I'm actually going to emulate a VAX 8650 by setting the CPU model to 8650. Uh, I'll start at the top here. We're going to give this 64 megabytes of RAM, so a nice, big, beefy fax system. Uh, set CPU idle equals VMS. This just instructs the SimH emulator to recognize when the VMS operating system is essentially in a wait state, um, just waiting for input or waiting for I.O. to return. So this keeps the SimH simulator from just pegging your Linux CPU 100% all of the time, even when the VMS system isn't doing anything. We are setting our first uh, hard disk to an RA92 model. I think that's about 1.2 gigabytes. And we are going to attach it to a disk file called rq0-ra92.dsk. So this will be our, uh, our disk file. And then I'm also attaching at uh, the controller RQ3 a virtual CD-ROM drive. And that CD-ROM drive is going to open that uh, OpenVMS hobbyist CD read-only. I'm disabling a bunch of devices that we just don't need right now. These are different kinds of disk controllers, some tape controllers, uh, a virtual console or a, a serial console multiplexer, the line printer. Uh, we don't need those for this experiment. So again, I'm just keeping this, this system really simple and minimal. So we can disable all of those. And then importantly, I am enabling the Ethernet interface. 
So this is an XU device on the VAX 8600. And I'm assigning it an arbitrary MAC address. Uh, this just needs to be a valid MAC address that is unique on your local network. And here's that magic step where we are attaching the XU Ethernet interface to the TAP interface that I've created called TAP VAX. And that's it. That's the entire configuration file. Um, so really, we're just giving the machine some RAM. We're giving it a hard disk. We're attaching that CD-ROM file. And we are attaching it to our network through this XU interface. So with that, I can run my VAX simulator. Um, so SimH starts up, and you can see it created that new hard drive file. Uh, and then it knows that this other CD image uh, is a, a read-only unit because I gave it that dash R flag. And you can see here we did successfully open the TAP VAX device here. Um, this is where if you had any kind of permissions problems, uh, you know, it wouldn't be able to open TAP VAX. A lot of people get around that by just running SimH, running this VAX 8600 executable um, as root. Uh, but I don't really like to run things as root that don't need to. Uh, so I've managed to get the permissions working on my system such that I can run as my regular user, uh, but still attached to that tap device I created. So with that, we can boot off of the CD, uh, emulated CD-ROM drive, RQ3. And here we go. This is just kind of a, a standalone backup restore version of VAX that's used to copy the initial installation files off of your install media onto your hard drive. Um, so it'll ask for the date. It is the 14th of April, 2020. Uh, we will call it 1727. Uh, now it will try to dynamically discover all of the devices that are available in the system. So this will just take a minute. Okay, so it's discovered all of the devices. Um, we just have that one RQ controller, uh, which is a hard drive controller that has four ports on it. We have that RA92 drive in DUA0. This will be our, our hard drive that we're installing on. We don't have anything attached to ports 1 and 2, so that just defaulted to RD54s, but again, there's nothing really there. Uh, and then DUA3 is our CD drive. So yes, those are all the devices I need. And now we're at the standalone backup prompt. So really, the only command we can run here is the backup command. And we'll use that to restore from the CD, so that DUA3 device. Uh, there is a backup save set called VMS073.b, and that is a save set. So that is the source for our backup command. And we are going to copy that to our hard drive, DUA0. And this will... Uh, give us then something that we can boot off of DOA0 to complete the rest of the installation. So that went very quickly, uh, certainly much faster than it ever would have in the real world. Uh, and then that's the only standalone backup operation we need. So you can halt the system by pressing Control e That takes you back to the SimH prompt. And now I can boot off of RQ zero, which is that DUA zero device uh, in terms of how VMS labeled it. All right, so now we're booting off of the hard drive using that kind of minimal system that has the installer that we just restored from the CD. And we'll just give it a minute here for VMS to boot up.
Okay, so we've booted into the OpenVMS VAX 7.3 installation procedure. It sees that we are a VAX model 8650. Uh, our system device is that DOA zero that we're booting off of. And once again, we enter the time. So it is 14 April, 2020. It's now 1731. So these are various normal OpenVMS boot messages. Opcom is the uh, operator communication facility of VMS. So all the messages that are being sent to the operator's console are showing up here. And now we're going through the interactive uh, installation procedure for VMS. So the first thing it wants to know is what we want to label our system disk. I'll just accept the defaults uh, through most of this because again, uh, the point of this isn't to set up a a real usable VAX cluster. It's just to create a, a small enough system that we can then boot our real VAX off of it. We are installing from DOA3. That's where the CD is. Yes, it's ready to be mounted. And here's all the components we can install. I will install the library files. I will install the optional files. I'll install the help database in the default location. We don't need the management station files. That's a Windows NT management client for uh, OpenVMS, which is interesting, but uh, not what we're looking at now. I don't need deck windows support. I will not install DeckNet Plus. I will install DeckNet Phase 4. So DeckNet Phase 4 is what most people are used to and what they think of when they talk about DeckNet. DeckNet Plus is a newer uh, and kind of much more advanced uh, version of DeckNet that is uh, quite incompatible, uh, even in terms of some of the overall concepts with DeckNet Phase 4. So we'll stick with DeckNet Phase 4. Uh, that, for example, is what the uh, the hobbyist TechNet network works off of, and that's what most people will use when they're talking about using DeckNet. So is this correct? Yes, those are the components I would like to install. Because this is running on my fast modern Linux system, that install goes shockingly quickly uh, for anyone who's ever tried to install VMS on real VAX hardware. Yes, we want to use the older version of DeckNet that requires a supplemental support contract. Uh, and now it's asking for passwords for some of these default user accounts. So I will set my passwords here. I don't know if I typed that one correctly. Yep, looks like I did. Okay, so the SCS node name, what is this system going to be called? I'm gonna call this VAX Sim so that we can easily recognize it as the simulated VAX. Now the SCS system ID uh, will also be this node's uh, essentially network ID, network number. And DECnet node uh, addresses are composed of an area and a node number. Um, so an area is kind of the network you're in, and then the node number is your particular node within that area. And, and then there's uh, an equation you run through to calculate a single number, the system ID, that represents the area number and the node number. And essentially the area number is just higher bits of the system ID. So the way you calculate that is you take the area number multiplied by 1024, and then you add your node number to it. So for simplicity, I'm just going to use area one, node one. So this simulated VAX's uh, decnet address will be 1.1. So 1024 times one plus one is 1025. So there's some more informational messages there about how you can modify what uh, has been installed. And we'll wait for the installation to finish. Um, it's going to, uh, again, recognize all the devices and configure them, and then it will reboot itself. And once it is rebooted, we will be in our freshly installed VMS system. 
Uh, so it wants to know now, do I have any product authorization keys I want to register? You could register your, your operating system license key at this point. I'm going to say no, because I have that script that, um, that just installs all of the licenses. It looks like we need to provide the time zone. So I'm in the United States and I am in Pacific time, which is 11. And yes, that is correct. And then is daylight savings time in effect? Yes, it is. So the correct time offset from UTC is minus seven hours. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so now it's finishing up and uh, generating the system parameters file, and then it will automatically reboot after this. There we go, it's performing the shutdown now. And indeed, it's telling you the system will automatically reboot after the shutdown and the installation will be complete. Okay, rebooting. And now you'll notice the startup message is actually OpenVMS VAX version V7.3, um, not that weird standalone version that was used for standalone backup or the installation process. And that's it. We've completed the site-specific startup commands. Uh, if we hit enter here, we'll get our login prompt. Welcome to OpenVMS VAX 7.3. So I can log in a system using the password I set during the installation process. You can show CPU, you can see we're on VAX SIM, a VAX 8650. It's also warning us that no license is active for the software product. Um, so essentially without the operating system license installed, you can only log in to the console. Uh, we won't be able to log in over the network or, or do anything like that. So the first thing I want to do is install those licenses. Um, so I'm logged in here. I'm going to hit Control E to return to the SimH prompt. So it's paused the simulation of the VAX, and I'm at the SimH prompt. Now I can attach read-only to my CD-ROM drive that MRW VMS kit that I've created. And then we're going to continue the simulation. So now I'm back in VMS. I need to mount that CD, uh, and I can mount it just for my user without needing to know the volume label, label by saying that on the mount command, we're going to override the ID and I'll mount the DUA3 device. Okay, that worked. We can list the contents of DOA3. The root directory of VMS file systems is called 000000. So if you're not familiar with uh, VAX or VMS directory syntax, you're, you're in for a surprise <laughs> when you've come from other platforms. Uh, so you can see these are the things that, again, I would typically install on a system. I use Multinet as my TCP IP stack. Um, I like having a sane CD command available just to make changing directories easier. I have a Dell tree command I like to install everywhere that allows me to recursively delete uh, directories and the files they contain. But none of that's necessary for what we're doing today. Um, we don't need an IP stack because we're just going to be booting our, uh, our satellite node over DeckNet. So really, the only thing I'm going to use the CD for is that it has my, uh, my licenses in here. And again, this is the license pack you get from the hobbyist program. Uh, which is ending, but if you get your hobbyist license request in now, uh, they will still send you hobbyist licenses that are good through the end of next year, through the end of 2021. Um, so if you're at all interested in playing with VMS, I'd recommend you do that, both to get the CD, the hobbyist CD, and your licenses um, before that program is terminated, and then we'll see what exactly the new VMS software incorporated does with it uh, in the future when everybody's licenses run out at the end of next year. And that's neither here nor there. I am simply going to run my 
licenses VA command. And this will install all of the software licenses you get for the hobbyist program, which are basically all the VAX operating system licenses with options uh, with DeckNet, with DeckNet routing, with shadow volume support. Um, so everything you might want to play with, uh, with the VAX VMS operating system itself, as well as a bunch of layered products uh, like the compilers. There's a C compiler, a basic compiler, a Pascal compiler, a Fortran compiler. Uh, I might be missing one in there. So they do give you quite a bit to play with, which is nice. Okay, so that's all the licenses. If I show licenses, you can see now these are all loaded into my system. Uh, DataTrieve is in there, and they actually give you the DataTrieve uh, software on the CD. So there's a lot you can play with. And as you can see, they're good through the end of 2021. They'll expire midnight, January 1st, 2022. We also have the VAX cluster license. That, of course, is important so that we can form our VAX cluster. Um, but that should be it. I'm going to dismount that CD because I don't need it anymore. And at this point, we should be able to set up DeckNet on this node. So I believe I can do that with sysmanager. And I think it's something like config net. Um, config net. No, it might be net config. Yep, there it is. Okay, so it's um, so the at symbol here runs DCL procedures. Uh, so the file is actually in the sys dollar manager directory, and then the file itself is netconfig.com. And because we're running a procedure, it knows to add the .com to the end of the file name if I don't provide an extension. So decknet for OpenVMS network configuration procedure. Uh, so my node name, we already are happy with Vax Sim. That's what I named it during installation. My decknet address, this is where I want it to be 1.1. .1. If you want to operate as a router, I'll just say no. Um, if I was going to join the system to HeckNet or a larger network, I'd probably need a router in my environment, but I just have directly connected nodes for now. And again, I'm just going to accept all the defaults for decknet config here because... We're just trying to do this relatively quickly. So that has written this big script to uh, to do all this configuration. Note it is creating some new accounts with uh, these passwords here. So if you are uh, making a video like this and people see these passwords and then you connect up to, uh, to HeckNet or something, they might be able to break into your system. So um, just be aware of that. <laughs> do you want these commands to be executed? Yes, I do. All right, so that went ahead and configured DeckNet. If I have my DeckNet license key uh, already installed, I can start DeckNet now. I do, so I'd like to. All right, so DeckNet started up. Uh, there's a note here that you need to add this command to your startup procedure so that DeckNet starts whenever you uh, reboot your system. So sysmanager startnet.com. Not what I wanted to do. So I'll do that now. We can edit uh, sys startup, and the startup procedure is sy startup underscore vms.com. So I'm just going to go down to the bottom of this file, and uh, there's already some commented out network start stuff earlier in the file, but just for simplicity, I'm just going to add that command right at the end of my file before the exit line. So we're going to start net on startup. Control Z saves the file and exits. I show net, we can just confirm that we do indeed have deck net with node vax sim with address 1.1. Now, last but not least, before we get to booting our satellite node, uh, we need to establish a vax cluster. So right now, if I show cluster, uh, you can see that it sees my node here, uh, but there's no member status. I'm I'm just a standalone system uh, that's not a member of any cluster. So the way we can create a new VAX cluster is with the sys manager. Uh, I think it's just config underscore cluster. Uh, nope. Uh, <laughs> sys manager cluster config 
there it is. I should probably write some notes or something before I record these videos. Uh, so cluster configuration program, DeckNet's installed. It detects that there's this LAN ACP server process and it recommends that we use LAN ACP to boot our uh, satellite nodes. Uh, now, in my experience, I actually haven't tried it with the XU device on the VAX 8600 yet, but certainly with the XA or XQ, whatever's used for the VAX 3900, uh, it's it's not actually a supported network interface type for the LAN boot service. So I'm just going to say no here, and that will uh, let us just keep using DECnet for the cluster booting service. So I'm going to add VAX sim. Again, this is the node name of this simulated VAX to an existing cluster, or in this case, we're going to form a new cluster. So option one, will the LAN be used for cluster communications? Yes, we do not have any other kind of physical interconnect between our systems, so we will use the LAN. Uh, the cluster's group number, this is just essentially the ID number of the cluster itself. I'm just going to call it 42. It needs a password so that uh, nobody can join your cluster without knowing the password. And then will this machine, VaxSim, be a boot server? Yes, it will. Okay. Uh, what is the ALO class parameter for this machine? I'm just going to use its node number one. I don't think this really matters in a single uh, single voting member cluster. Does it contain a quorum disk? No, we do not have a quorum disk. And uh, now this cluster config script will go ahead and make the changes to the system parameters for me. So we'll say yes, we'll run autogen. And this is going to run Autogen, and it will reboot my machine here. And there we go, performing the reboot. OK, and now we're booting back up. So you can see it's a little bit different on this boot. We're now waiting to form or join a VMS cluster system. Uh, we're loading the disk server. So we didn't load the disk server before, but this will be the component that allows us to share any disks in this machine, in our simulated VAX, um, out over the network to any other uh, machines in our cluster. So this always takes a minute to start. So we'll just have a little bit of patience. All right. Uh, I don't know if you saw it scrolled off there, but it said proposing the formation of a VMS cluster and that uh, the state transition completed and that we're now a member of the cluster. So the boot has finished and invalid parameter delimiter check use of special characters.com. It looks like something didn't work. That was probably the line I added to start DECnet because that's really the only change we've made that we could have screwed up. So let's edit that sys startup, sci startup vms.com. Go back down to the bottom. Uh, yes, I forgot the at sign before that. So again, if you want to run a command procedure, you run it with at and then the command procedure. So I'll save that. Uh, and since that didn't run automatically, let's just go ahead and start net now. Okay, so now DECnet is running again. Uh, and since I fixed the startup file, it should start automatically on every boot now. All right. I feel like we should all take a deep breath. Um, that was a lot very quickly, but essentially, if we, and we can verify this if we show cluster, we installed VMS on a new... Uh, empty hard drive, we configured DECnet, and we formed a new VAX cluster. Uh, you can see now this simulated VAX node is a member of my VAX cluster. So having done all of that, we are in a position to add our real VAX, my little VAX station 4000, as a satellite node 
uh, in this cluster. And that means that it will boot off of the boot server running on this node. So to do that, we run the cluster configuration utility again. And I've already forgotten, is it cluster underscore config? Yep. Again, it's saying, hey, you should think about using this LAN ACP version, um, which you can directly get to by going cluster underscore config underscore LAN. Uh, but again, I'm going to just stick with pure decknet for now. And what we want to do is to add a VAX node to the cluster. So we will say one. Uh, and this is just telling us about expected votes and quorums. Um, satellite nodes typically don't get a vote in the cluster. Um, so we don't care. We'll just say yes, we want to continue. Will this be a satellite? Yes. Okay, so what is the node's decknet node name going to be? Uh, we called this vax sim. I'm going to call my vax station vax stn for vax station. And what do I want its decknet node address to be? Well, again, this system is 1.1, so we can let the vax station be 1.2. And finally, it needs to know what is the hardware address of the LAN adapter of the satellite we're adding. Right? So this way, the cluster will know to listen for boot requests from a particular hardware address. Uh, and then that's how it will be able to associate that node that's trying to boot with the configuration for this new system we're defining. Uh, so when we powered up that VAC station, remember on the console, it gave us its hardware address. It is 08002B. 2B CD D4. All right, now wants to know what do we want to use as the system root for this new machine? And uh, in this case, we're going to use our local disk OVMS VAX sys. Remember, that's the name that we gave. Uh, this local machine's hard drive when we ran the installation process. So I'll just accept that default. And then for every satellite node, uh, the, the boot disk, the system disk, gets a system-specific folder just to hold any of the data that's specific to that one system. Um, so it's recommending the name sys10, and it will just assign these incrementally. So I'll accept that default. Uh, do I want to allow a conversational bootstrap on VAT station? No, we don't need to. We'll just let it boot automatically. What workstation options do we want? Um, so I'm going to say one, no workstation software. But had I installed Deck Windows, and if I then install the add-on product uh, Deck Windows motif, uh, we can actually have that VAC station workstation because it has a video card in it. And it supports a local keyboard and mouse. Again, I don't have one, but if I did, um, that system could boot up as a graphical workstation using deck windows uh, from this server. But we'll just accept the default of no workstation software. It's going to create that local system directory. Will VACStation be a disk server? No, I don't need it to because, again, the local disk is only going to be used for page and swap. We'll just let it auto-size that page file, um, an arbitrary number to start with and we will let it auto-size the swap file. And again, it needs just a starting point before Autogen can compute a proper value for the system. Do I want to use a local disk on VAC station for paging and swapping? Why, yes, I do. Um, does it have any RFXX disks? That's a particular type of disk controller. No, it does not. OK, so now this, uh, this configuration procedure is now waiting for that node to boot for the first time so that it can, uh, among other things, initialize its local drive and create the page and swap files, uh, and then create any other system-specific files that go in its system-specific route. So I'm going to switch back over to the VAX station. I will see you over there. So before we look at the front again, I just wanted to show you briefly what's going on back here. Um, as you can see, it has this kind of video port on his video card. Uh, I don't have a monitor or adapter that works with that. And then it also uses uh, 
some kind of proprietary keyboard connector. But it does have a serial port, and so we just have the serial console plugged in to the back of that WISE 520 terminal. And we also have its Ethernet interface. Um, so it has an AUI or a, uh, what would that be? That'd be a ThinNet port. Uh, in this case, I'm using the AUI port with a TINBASE T transceiver, and that is what's plugged into my local network. So other than that, we just have the power cord into the VAX and the terminal, um, and that's all it takes, just a serial console and the Ethernet network. Back at the serial console here, we'll show the devices that this uh, VAX station has. So this will spin up the hard drive. You can see the first device is that network interface, ESA0. And then there's also that DKA0 hard drive, uh, which looks to be a massive 2.1 gigabyte drive. So now we will tell it to boot from, ah, messed that up. We can boot from ESA0, and this will instruct it to boot from the network. So it's now sending out a broadcast packet asking, hey, is there any boot server available? And it has this hardware ID associated with it. And it should get a response back from our simulated VAX. And sure enough, on the console of our simulated VAX, we can see that it received a boot request and it is uh, loading the operating system. And back here on our VAX station, we already have the initial boot up, uh, OpenVMS VAX version 7.3. So this will take a minute, uh, but we will let it go through this boot process and some initial configuration. So waiting to tune system. Now, if we look back over on our uh, the configuration uh, script over on our simulated VAX, uh, here it's asking, where do we want to put that page and swap file? And it's giving us a list of the disks that are available on that system that just booted. So, well, there's only one disk, so I'm just going to copy and paste that, and that will be our paging and swapping device. Uh, it's asking, may we initialize that device? So we are going to reformat that drive. Uh, am I satisfied with the backup of that disk? Well, I don't have a backup of that disk, but yes, I'm satisfied. Okay, so it's initializing the hard drive in the VAC station now, and it is creating the page file and swap file. Okay, so now it's gonna run Autogen over on VAC station and uh, it will then reboot. So you can see back here over on the VAX station console, uh, it's waiting to tune the system. It'll start the autogen process here. Uh, and unlike on the simulated VAX, the autogen process on this real VAX station uh, takes several minutes. So we'll uh, speed this up or uh, cut the video here. But it will finish, and it will reboot on its own. Okay, so we're about four or five minutes later now. You can see the autogen process is finished. And the VAX station is now rebooting. Over on the server side on VAX SIM, you can see it received the message from the initial configuration process that it all completed successfully. So now um, I should be actually I should be able to show cluster continuous. You can see, sure enough, VAX station is a member 
of the cluster. And as it reboots, uh, we'll see some messages come up that probably mess with our screen, <laughs> um, but it will show the various state transitions that VaxStation is going through as it reboots. So we're now in the boot phase. You can see that we're booting from Vax Sim. Note that the MAC address has been changed from what we put in our SimH configuration file. Uh, the way DECnet works is it doesn't use ARPS or any protocol like that. It actually changes the machine's MAC address to reflect the DECnet address. So as soon as you start DECnet, the MAC address changes. But we don't need to worry about that. That all happens automatically. Uh, you can see that the VMS 7.3 software on VaxStation was in the new state. Now it's in the member state as it goes through its boot process. And now we're just waiting for the system to finish starting. Okay, so the VaxStation started up. Let's log in. Perfect, it worked. Uh, because this terminal supports it, it automatically changed it to 132 character line width, which uh, makes everything tiny. But if we show CPU, we can see we have a VAX station 4060. And when we show mounted devices, we can see that the VAX station DKA0 is mounted. So that is our local disk that we're using for the page file and swap file. But the system disk is mounted over the deck net from VAX sim. So that's node one, disk DUA0. And that's our OVMS VAX sys volume. So that's it. We have network booted our VAX station 4060 over Ethernet, excuse me, over Ethernet from the simulated VAX using SimH on our Linux desktop. And you can see here, if I leave the monitor um, again, just to get a clean version of that, you can see my cluster here. I can do things like set host, um, see if it knows it by name, Vax Station. Yep, so this is kind of the equivalent of Telnet over DECnet. So I'm now logging into my Vax Station from my simulated Vax. Um, so here, if I show CPU, you can see we're now on the Vax Station. Uh, and again, from this guy's perspective, we can see the cluster. So from the perspective of VAX station, it also sees both cluster members. Um, so yeah, we have a, a two-member VAX cluster with the VAX station being a satellite node netbooting off of VAX sim. And I really find it impressive how easy that was. Uh, I've set up a lot of Linux systems to netboot. Uh, I've set up uh, SGI IRIX systems to netboot to do the install over the network. Uh, and it's not exactly rocket science, but having to mess around with a boot piece server and a TFTP server to send the initial network boot image across, there's just a lot of manual steps to make that work. And I always mess something up initially and have to troubleshoot and debug it. Um, maybe if I did it even more often, I'd be better at it. But in the VAX world, it's just a nice built-in feature of your cluster configuration to say, oh yeah, there's another VAX out there that I want to net boot as a satellite node for my cluster. Um, and really, you give it the Ethernet hardware address, and it just takes care of the rest. So like so many other ways, VAX clusters, the clustering technology, uh, even the networking technology in general in VMS was pretty far ahead of its time 
both in terms of usability and capability. So thanks for watching. Uh, again, this was something a little bit different. I don't know that uh, that YouTube has has ever seen a real uh, Vax hardware net boot off of a SimH simulated Vax system. Um, but if you are interested in more Open VMS content, uh, we could probably do a couple of videos on on just installing Open VMS in SimH. Uh, as well as installing the layered products and just some, again, little niceties I like to do on new uh, VMS systems just to make them a little bit more usable. If that kind of content sounds interesting to you as a break from uh, the normal MVS or IBM mainframe content, go ahead and let me know in the comments below. Uh, and if if folks seem to want that, I, I do have a couple ideas for VMS videos. Otherwise, thanks a lot for watching. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.